Philippians chapter 3. Everybody hear me okay? Is this picking me up all right? So Philippians chapter 3. just going to focus on, uh, on one verse this morning and verse two I think uh, you know the Apostle Paul has given some some advice uh, you know we've we've been talking about you know uh, for me to live as Christ to die as gain and then we're kind of past that point and and then he gets to uh, kind of uh, kind of a different uh, thinking process about how you know, how can you, you know, how do you, you know, how do you protect yourself in this world? You know, as you grow as a church, as an assembly of believers, we come to, uh, we come to chapter three and uh, the apostle Paul, he gives some advice here in verse two. Um, I'll read verse one just to give us a little bit more of a context, but uh, really we're going to focus on verse two. And it says, finally, my, my brethren rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. So I think that gives us a good context about what we can expect when we come next, that, that these things are, are basically for believers. You know, whenever you start, and as I'm going through, as I was studying this week, you know, unbelievers are not gonna accept what we're about to talk about very well. And there's a reason for it. We're talking about them. We're going, to be, we're going to be talking about people that are unbelievers and the things that they do, how they're really, they're, they're failing the grace of God. And, but for the Apostle Paul, he's like, these things aren't grievous, but it's good for you guys to know this information, to be watchful. <clears throat> and that's exactly what he says in verse 2. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concession. So, uh, anybody know what any of that means? It's hard, right? To understand that verse means that you have to understand the first part of the Bible. You've got to understand the Old Testament. You're gonna, we're, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to go. We're going to go back. We're going to reach into the Old Testament a little bit today, and then. Uh, we're going to use some of the New Testament to explain it. But those, there are those out there, and they are, they are false teachers. They have itching ears, or, or they, they minister to people with itching ears, and they give them what they want to say. They're not going to step on the toes of those who are just living abundant, sinful lives. They are concerned about the numbers that they have in their congregation, not concerned about the 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 discipleship growth of their congregation um i'm gonna i'm just gonna be honest with you i am more concerned about your personal discipleship health with your lord and savior than i am about filling the place up with people who are unbelievers i, I hope that makes sense because we could get a bunch of unbelievers in here and you know what's going to happen they're going to they're going to try to force the rest of us to do what they want. They're going to they will try to force me to say what they want me to say and to be easy on sin. There's a problem with that. Jesus is not easy on sin. It would be it's no good for me to get up here and preach to you God's word and then you die and you stand before Jesus Christ as an unsaved person. And you die and you go to hell. All the things that I've said to you was in vain, if that's the point. So this morning, we're going to talk about some difficult stuff. And we're going to talk about the things that's in our world. Some things to look out for that are trying to get inside the church and to change the narrative. They don't want me to say some of the things 
that I'm probably going to talk about this morning. They, they would rather that subject be left off the table, you know, to, to leave them alone and just let them live their sinful life. Well, there's a problem. Which, which prophet in the Old Testament did God say, leave sin alone, don't mess with that, don't touch that topic? Can you think of a prophet? The only ones that I can think of were the prophets of Baal. They were the only ones that left the sinful topics alone. In fact, they said, and they would be, they would be lying ministers to them. And you, know, and you know what happens as a result for that? When they're challenged with their spirituality, just like Elijah, one guy challenged all of them to see who could call down fire from heaven. Who actually has an ear with the Almighty? Those guys do not. And their message condemns people to an eternity without God and separation in a place called hell. I don't want anybody to go there. I want people to be warned. And to warn them means that you've got to talk about some difficult subjects sometimes. This morning we're going to talk about some difficult to topics that has infiltrated the assembly of many believing places. Would you all pray with me? Dear Lord, that you would give us discretion this morning, that you'd give us understanding, that you would help us, Lord, to seek your face and to acknowledge you and your word to apply it to our lives, to minister your gospel of truth, and that you would help us, Lord, that we will be faithful. Even though times get more and more difficult, even though the outside forces want to dictate what we speak and what we say, it doesn't matter what, we, what, they, what they want us to do. What's going to matter ultimately is what is written down in the book of life. Is their names written in the book of life? Lord, this morning, that we could look into your word and understand it better and show us things that we should look out for, especially in these final days. Fill me, Lord, with your spirit and fill your people with your spirit that we may be able to understand exactly what you want us to understand. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <coughs> this first one. says, beware of dogs. Now, I know a lot of people have had that sign up on their, you know, at, at their house, on their gate, that says, beware of dogs. So, if you go up to a house, and you see a sign, beware of dogs, and you knock on the door, and you hear the loudest, roughest bark that you've ever heard, what would you do? Absolutely. Absolutely. You would run away. You're like, how fast can I get from, from the mouths of babes and sucklings, right? Paul says that there are some things out there that are dogs and you need to be aware of. Now, that means that we've got to find out what is this thing. If he's going to make a sign like that, I want to know. I want to know. You know, if it looks like Austin's Great Dane or if it looks like, you know, a, a tiny little schnauzer, you know, that's mouth open, only opens up an inch. You know, there's a big difference. Have y'all seen his Great Dane? Man, that thing, it's scary. I've been over to his house and it stands up on the fence and I look up to it. That's, uh, that's and you know what? I'm a little bit concerned because I'm like, that thing could just hop back over. And uh, anyway, big dog. Beware of these things. Look what, look what Matthew chapter 7 says in verse 6. <clears throat> it says, Give not that which is holy unto dogs. Okay? This is Jesus talking. Give not that which is holy unto dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Okay, that's a warning from Jesus, right? Where are these dogs, Jesus? Not that which is holy unto dogs, neither cast your pearls before swine. Because what they'll do is they'll turn around and they will rend you. 
You know, there are some people in this world, they will not accept the gospel. And they will, and they would like to destroy you. You know, sometimes you'll have this conversation about, well, who do I witness to? Well, you witness to everybody. But there's some people out there, if you witness to them, they would like to hurt you. And Jesus is basically saying, those people like that, the Holy Spirit has not been ministering to them. You can't save anybody. Do you understand that? It doesn't matter how much you give them the gospel, you can save nobody. Only Jesus Christ can save people. And if he has not been working on those people... They may turn and rend you. And you've got, to, you've got to follow the leading of the Spirit with those things. There are some people out there that you know that it's going to be rough. They want to hurt you. What are these dogs? Jesus says, don't give that which is holy unto the dogs. Now, there is a mindset, okay? And it's important to understand what this mindset is is and how and for us to make sure that we don't uh well we don't jeopardize ourselves now you can you know you can do you can you can actually present that information to the people of that understanding you can it's just you've got to know that you might have to fight your way out of that you have to know that they're going to be gunning for you you know, it kind of reminds me of, a, of a, as of late, there's a politician. I think he's in, um, oh, goodness, I can't remember where he is. But uh, he's dealing with some of the same things like what we're dealing with here in Jonesboro with the, with the library and some of the books. And he called, he called some of these books filth, and he's a politician. And you know what immediately happened? The dogs jumped on him. And he's having to defend himself as a politician against that. He has chosen that fight. Sometimes, sometimes we have to take the fight on. Sometimes somebody has to do it. Otherwise, the dogs take over. So, so somebody's going to do it. And, you know, just like Elijah with the prophets of Baal. He took them on, but he felt like he was alone. Jeremiah, he took, a, he took them on. You see, do you understand what I'm talking about? That's what it looks like. But if you can be aware of that before, you have to fight. You know what? Maybe we can, you know, maybe we can preserve ourselves a little bit better. Maybe, you know, maybe we they don't they won't want to fight. You know, they'll run away. They'll know that, okay, righteousness and holiness is a little bit too strong, and they'll run away. Because dogs will do that. You know, I was telling Austin the other day that when I was in Utah, I was walking across the top of the mountain. I was bow hunting. Had no idea what I was doing. Probably a little bit insane to be up there by myself. But I looked across this ridge, and I saw this, this animal that looked kind of like a coyote about, I don't know, a little over 100 yards away. And I watched it for a little bit to see what it was doing. It was watching this squirrel that was playing in this tree. And it stood up. And it was as big as the biggest deer that you've seen in Arkansas. It was a wolf. And I had a bow. And you know what it did? I think it realized it was by itself. You see, a dog by itself, duh, it, he, he didn't want none of me. Now, I didn't really want none of him either. And it saw that I had something in my hand. It saw that I had a weapon. And when it saw me, it took off in the other direction. Of course, I didn't follow it. I went the other direction too. Because I didn't really want to get in that fight. But you see what I'm saying? If you're, if you're armed with the right things, you're not going to look like a prey. That's why the scripture says that you should gird yourself with the armor of God. That you should have the sword of the Spirit. That you should be praying regularly and it's okay for God's people to stand against unrighteousness and holiness especially if you have the armor of God because there's more with us 
than with them. If you don't believe me, just ask Elijah and his servant. When the Syrian army comes and surrounds Elijah, it's just him and his servant. And he looks up. And the servant is afraid. He's like, Elisha, what are we going to do? And he's like, relax. There's more with us than with them. And he prays, God, would you open up his eyes so he could look around and he saw in the mountains was God's angels, God's militia, ready to fight. So we've got to know, are we ready? Because issues are coming to us. Issues are coming, and we need to know what to be aware of. 2 Peter 2 and 22 says, But it has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to wallowing in the mire. Revelation 22, 15, For without our dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers, and adulterers, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. So what are these dogs? Look in Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse 17. Deuteronomy 23 and verse 17. Verses 17 and 18. If you'll look there with me. It says, Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore or the price of a dog into the house of the Lord thy God for any vow, for even both these are abomination unto the Lord. Thou shalt not lend upon usury to thy brother. Oh, I, oh that's 18. Oh, go back to 17. I missed 17. I don't know why. There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore or the price of a dog into the house of the Lord thy God for any vow, for even both these are abomination unto the Lord thy God. Y'all see where the scripture is going with this. This is not me. This is the scripture saying these things. There is a mentality out there that when it comes on people, it is a tough, tough change to get them out of that lifestyle. Do you understand that? There are the uh, um, American Family Association, they put out a video called In His Image. I actually showed it one Sunday night here. And it talks about those who go into this type of lifestyle where they, 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 they're confused about their gender. They, don't, they just don't know. And sometimes they're a boy. Sometimes they think they're a girl. And this stuff is being taught in our schools now. It's being shoved down the, the throats of kids at, even at the library. It's like this stuff is just all over the place. And you stand up against it, the attacks are coming. You don't even have to talk about that subject matter. All you have to do is talk about, well, we don't want books that show pornography being distributed to kids. And all of a sudden, you're anti-gay. You're anti-whatever on that. You are talking about censorship. I, I had no idea I was going to be running into this in Philippians. I, I really didn't. But I'm living, I'm living this fight in my, in my own personal life right now. And you know what it feels like? It feels very alone. And I start questioning, where's the other pastors in this? They're MIA. They're, where are they at? All the big church pastors haven't heard a peep out of those guys. A few smaller church pastors, a few. And the scripture says, beware. Why? Because they come in and they say, it's all about love. Isn't God love? Do you're, you see where that goes? God's happy when you're happy. You've heard some of this stuff. The scripture says, don't bring that mindset into my house. Can those people be saved? They absolutely can. 
but it's tough because they're confused in their mind and in their heart. They, the, problem, the biggest problem is, is that they don't want to accept the truth that God actually did make male and female. God set a standard. He didn't make any accidents. You are who you are because God made you that way. And when, if you're confused about who you are, well, really what you need to do is you need to be, it, it's not who you are that's confusing you. It's understanding who God is that's confusing you. That's the problem, is that they don't want to accept a God who can make male and female. They want a God who, who just makes me happy, who gives me whatever I want. I'd rather have a God that's more like a genie than one that's going to set a standard for life. One that's going to set down the framework of marriage. You realize God made marriage? He set, He established it. You didn't. God did. And you know what's happened? The state has come in and hijacked it. I was, I was talking to Austin about this. The state has hijacked it, right? Used to, before the state took control over marriage and started taxing people that got marriage, is that you could open up your, your Bible, and you could find certificate of marriage. And they, the publishers did that. So for people that lived out in, the, in no man's land, you know, where, where the state hasn't taken over yet, and they, they, could, they could sign it, they could put the witnesses down, and they could tear it out. This certifies you that you are married under the eyes of the Almighty. It doesn't matter. Not for the state, but when the state took over, did you see it coming? We can redefine marriage now. That's what the scripture is talking about here. Beware of those who, who have that type of mindset, who think that, that sex can is, is, it's okay if it's casual. It's okay if it's for hire. You can do whatever it is that you want. It's your body. And God says, your body is not your own. You're bought with a price. Have you been redeemed? You, are, you don't own yourself anymore. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. God resides in it. Romans 12. Y'all remember that verse? Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. And I would like to ask the question to those who, who tend to that mindset. Where is holiness in that? Where is righteousness? And you think I'm talking about just that community? I'm not just talking about that, that community. I'm talking about anybody that would use their body as a lustful transition with somebody else. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That's what we're talking about. That it is between the man and his wife, anything outside of that is an abomination to God. Can it be forgiven? It absolutely can be forgiven. But it is tough for people to get away from their sin and to accept, God made me to be better than this. Can you be redeemed? You absolutely can. But you need to agree with God on it. That's important. But it is tough. It is tough. And we live in a world that is okay. That, and I get it. This is probably not a very popular message. But think about what's happened in the church. The rate of divorce is the same as outside the church. Promiscuity in between with the teenagers is the same inside the church as it is on the outside of the church. The, the alternate lifestyle is as bad in the church as it is outside the church. So what's happened? That mentality has come in and Paul says, beware of it. Beware when women want to present themselves sexually impure and 
give themselves away casually for hire. You know, we have all kinds of websites that are set up for that now. It's all over the place. He says also the, the dog that he refers to there in Deuteronomy is the male version of that. The, t the context, okay, of what we're talking about in Philippians is those who come around God's people to try to develop sexual perversions inside of God's ecclesia, inside of God's church. That's what we're talking. That's what Philippians is talking about. Does that mean that when you leave here, that you go and treat those people worse? You treat them as somebody who's made in the image of God. They are worth respecting because God made them. Does that mean that you that you accept their sin? You don't accept the sin. You don't affirm it. But you, as a believer, you believe. That you serve a mighty God, the one that made the heavens and the earth and put the stars in a place. You don't believe that the, the God who did all that can, can leave somebody there if they want to accept him as Lord and Savior. What he will do is he will transform them. They will be transformed by the renewing of their mind. I get it. We think, well, you're, you're talking about the, the sexual perversions, Brother Mitch, but there's so much more. I understand that there's so much more. There's drug abuse. There's alcohol abuse. There's all kinds of things out there. We're pinpointing one specific thing. I get it. God can transform you if you've got that issue. If you think <clears throat> pornography is okay, you're wrong. It's not okay. You realize that, that is a, that's a gateway into the sex slave industry? That's why it's so prevalent right now. Why do young girls come up missing all the time? Why do young boys come up missing all the time? They've been probably smuggled into that, into that lifestyle. There's more. Did you know that there's more sex slaves than there is now? There's more slaves in that industry now than there was prior to the Civil War. That's what we're dealing with. You thought slavery was gone. It's gotten worse. And these people, they, don't even, they won't even live past 25 because it's not just that lifestyle that gets them. They start dumping a bunch of drugs and stuff in them. And God says, beware that mentality when it tries to enter into the church. We've got to talk about it because it is something. And it's destroying our country. It's destroying our culture right here in Jonesboro. That there are people that are trying to fight against it. And it is a fight. It is a fight. And who knew that the fight would start at the library? But it is nevertheless a fight. Now what does that mean for us? That means we need to be careful about what's going on. We need to be prepared. Be mentally sound. Take on the whole armor of God. And when that, and to beware. Beware when it comes to you. Because that's what it does. It will come to you. It will come to your children, your grandchildren, your nieces, your nephews. It's searching, it's hunting them. That's what, that's what all of this is really about. That's why the fight at the library is so intense. Because they're, they're actually targeting children. They're targeting children. And we suggest move, move those books. Prevent the children from getting to it. And they will not. That's just, that's a little bit. There's more. There's more. The Apostle Paul says... Beware of evil workers. Now, I think most people can know what this is. This is bad nature, thinking, feelings, acting, troublesome, injurious, destructive. 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen says, For such are false apostles. Okay? There are those who sneak in and they work evil amongst our midst. They have a bad nature. Their thinking is wrong. They have evil feelings. They act bad. 
They cause trouble. They try to injure other people inside. They'll, they'll, they'll talk about this person over here to this person over here about you. Instead of coming to you if they have a problem, they're not, they don't really care if you're a problem or not. They just, want to, they just want to cause a problem. So they talk about you, but never to you. And if you go to them and, and, and ask them about it, oh, I never said anything like that. And, and, and they'll, even be your, they'll even present a, a friendly face to you. The scripture says, beware. Beware of that. They transform themselves even into the apostles of Christ sometimes. 2 Timothy 2, 3-4, it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. You know, it wouldn't surprise me if the message that I presented to you today is not accepted by some of you today. Just like the prophecy said here in Timothy, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They will not like it. They will not hear it. And they will be mad at you for presenting it. Listen, you can be mad at me all you want. You are the one who's going to stand before Almighty God. And I have to stand before Almighty God. And I will have to give an account for myself as much as you are. And God has put me in a position that says, if you fail to warn my people about the coming judgments, then you are guilty. And you have blood on your hands. This morning, no blood on my hands. I want to tell you what the Bible says about it. So when you stand before Almighty God, you will never be able to say, well, Brother Mitch never told me that. Brother Mitch did tell you that. I wanted to warn you of the judgment to come. Flee from those things. Accept the righteousness of Jesus Christ on your life. He can heal you. He can forgive you. He can wash you as white as snow. Though your sins be as crimson, they can be made as, as white as wool. He wants to forgive you. He wants to cast those sins as far as the east is from the west. Why would he do that? Because he loves you and he wants to redeem you to himself. He didn't die on the cross just so that you could do Operate in your own lustful pleasures, but so that you could be operate under the goodness and the gracious of God and be his witness in this troublesome world. That's why. He can forgive you. He can heal you. He can give you a blank slate. And you know what my job is? Besides just warning you that what God can forgive, I forgive too. It doesn't matter what's in your past. The past is not what's supposed to define you. The past is not supposed to be how you identify yourself. Jesus Christ should be how you identify yourself. So don't come saying, well, I'm a gay Christian. I want to hear, I want to hear, are you redeemed from their gayness? Are you redeemed from... From your wickedness. If you were a murderer. Are you a murderous Christian? Have you been forgiven? You're not a murderous Christian anymore. You're a forgiven Christian. You're born again. Have you been in prostitution? You can be forgiven in Christ. Have you been a liar? You can be forgiven in Christ. And that's not how you identify yourself. Hello, I'm a liar. No, you present yourself how God sees you. Holy and acceptable unto him. Someone made in the image of the Almighty. Not wanting somebody to give you, to, to, that will itch your ears for you. But just like Timothy 4 says, they, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Let me give you one final thought. Second Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 7. It says, 
Know this also, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. You think we're there yet? Most people will say, we're, we're there. Listen to what he says. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous. That means they're going to want what everybody else wants. They don't want to work for it. They just want somebody to give it to them. They'll be boasters. Proud. Welcome to June. Pride month. They'll be proud. They're proud of who they are in their sinfulness. You know, as a believer, I'm not proud of any of my sins. I'm not. I'm ashamed of my sins. But let me tell you what I'm not ashamed of. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For me, it is the power of God unto salvation. Do you know the power that comes with being saved and redeemed? Being bought with a price. Knowing that God doesn't see my sin anymore. He doesn't see me as a boaster or proud or a blasphemer. Even being disobedient to parents. He can fix that. He can change me. And you know what? He did change me. When I was 14, I was very disobedient to my parents. And then something happened. Something changed between me and my parents. There was a relationship alteration. And you know what that alteration was? My relationship with my Savior changed. That's what it means to be born again. I didn't want to be disobedient anymore. And you know what accompanied that? I was unthankful. But then I became thankful. I was unholy. And God made me holy. Not because I'm holy, but because he is holy. They have, they're without natural affection. Oh my goodness. Sister Mary and I were talking about a lady who, abandoned, who all, practically abandoned her kids. All, she, she said she checked on them every now and then, every other week or so. And she thought the state was wrong. For accusing her. She didn't have natural affection. Y'all want to hear one of the other library books that we're dealing with? It teaches three-year-olds and down. It's one of those, it's one of those children's books, right? You know, the, the extra thick cardboard so they can chew on it for a while and it lasts. It teaches little kids about being a pansexual. You know what that is? You want to have sex with everyone. Not just men and women. That's bisexual. Everyone. You know what that means? Everyone. All ages. It doesn't matter. They're attracted to everybody. And that's in a little kid's book. And they're okay with that. I'm not okay with that. Jesus Christ is not okay with that. And that is one of the reasons why he's going to return. Because he's going to have to clean this mess up. Because I realize as hard as I fight against it, I'm not going to be able to fix this stuff. Only Jesus Christ can fix it. We're almost done. Truth breakers, false accusers, incontent, fierce. Oh my goodness, the, the, just the venom that pursues out of people's mouths these days. Attacking without any, any reason to. Despisers of those who are good. Traitors, heady, high-minded. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but departing from and den but denying the power thereof. That's exactly what we're seeing in the local church in Jonesboro, Arkansas. Otherwise, there would be there, the, the, the library meeting Monday would be full of people from all the denominations because they're like, no, we're not putting up with this junk anymore. We've got standards in this town, but do we really? Do we really? I'm sorry, maybe I'm stepping on a box here because I've been dealing with some issues. But what would it take for us to recognize what's really going on in our assemblies? He says, they deny the power thereof. You know what? I truly believe that Jesus Christ could heal every single person in Jonesboro, Arkansas. I believe that he could save them. I believe that he could bring an awakening. 
But what he's looking for is the ones who do believe to be faithful. You know, the, I think it was the second great awakening happened because four guys got together and started praying. They believed. They believed. From such having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. But in reality, they're the ones who have itching ears. You know, I've got more to say, but I'm going to just end it right there. You know, this world has been teaching you a lot of stuff over the past years. And they have been trying to rewrite what's right and what's wrong. Do you think that a society that's built on the principles of Satan are really going to fully understand what's right and wrong? This is how our system thinks about right and wrong. Prayer needs to be taken out of school. Abortion is okay. The Ten Commandments need to come down from our judicial systems. That is what our society says is okay. But that's not what the Bible says is okay. That's not what God's word says is okay. And there is a day coming. There's a day coming real soon that your knee is going to bow before Jesus Christ. You know how I know that? The scripture says, for every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Yeah. And then the books are going to be opened. The book of life, the book of thoughts, conscience, works, secret deeds, all those things are going to be presented. The first thing that's going to be looked for is your name written in the Lamb's book of life. If your name is not there, the other stuff isn't going to matter near as much. You know what I'm, you know what I'm thankful for? About the name that's written there. If your name is written there, those books, when God starts thumbing through it, and he starts coming across all my sins and my wicked deeds. You know what he sees? Nothing. I, even I, am he that blotteth out. Thy transgressions for my own sake and will not remember thy sins. Hey, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today? Is there some sins that you're holding on to because the world has told you it's okay? But you know, deep down, the Bible says it's not okay. Repent. Oh, that's a scary word, isn't it? That's exactly the words that Jesus Christ said. Unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. You must repent of your sins and be born again. Let Jesus Christ make a change in your life. And beware. When society tries to throw this other stuff down your throat and tell you that you must affirm these things. May God find me faithful that what I affirm is his testimonies. That's what I should affirm in my life and be transformed by the renewing of my mind. Song leader and the pianist would come. Pray with me, dear Lord, that you would change our minds and our hearts, Lord. May we take on your mind and live the life that you want us to live. I know, Lord, that society has told us a whole different version about how you have established things. Lord, that we would accept your way of thinking and that you would renew us, Lord. And make us more like you. I know, Lord, that you can fix us. You want to fix us. You want to heal us. I know that it doesn't happen overnight. That it, sometimes it takes time. But, Lord, that you would just create in us a new heart. And that you would take out our heart of stone. 
that you would put in the heart of flesh that we may be able to accept your word and your testimonies in our life. That we can see Jesus as the Savior that he is and that he can make us, that he can change us and make us new. Lord, we need this. Our world is tough and it has been throwing all kinds of different ideas in our paths and trying to change the way we think. Lord, may we take on your mind and that you would renew our thinking process and heal us, Lord, from where we have sinned and where we have fallen short of the glory of Almighty God and be endowed with the power from on high that only comes from the knowledge of knowing Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.